you forevermore to proclaim. I can't wait for that day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Uh, our scripture reading is going to be Luke 2, verses 25 to 38. Luke 2, verses 25 to 38. When you have that, would you stand please and read with me? Let me read God's word. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for a consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fasting and prayers, night and day. And coming into that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you so much that we have a glimpse of you, Lord, through your word. And uh, we pray, Lord, that we continue to seek you fully, Lord, and Look to your face for direction, Lord. Bless this uh, sermon, Lord, as presented by Pastor Gary. Put upon his heart, Lord, that he preached from the Holy Spirit, Lord. We're eager to hear and open our hearts and minds to his sermon. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful songs. Enjoyed that. Really great. Praising the Lord. Hearing people and seeing them smile if they lift up the things of the Lord. Amen. The greatest thing you do is what you just did. Amen. Praise God. And again, Michael, I love your reading voice. <laughs> Luke 2, 25 to 38, I've entitled the message, Today a Forgotten Couple. Don't get the impression that they were married. They were not. They were just two elderly people who hung out at the temple. That doesn't happen like that anymore, where people just kind of hang out at church and the doors are open seven days a week. Most of the time the doors of church are, are locked, unfortunately. But uh, here were some servants of God who prophesied and prayed and fasted and looked for God to do what God had promised to do. They knew that God would come through. They just were waiting for his fullness of time to come through with the promises and the miracles that God had given this forgotten couple, Simeon and Anna, kind of a part of the Christmas story that is not highlighted too often. Uh, somebody should call Hallmark and ask them why there are not more Christmas cards about Simeon and Anna, and uh, they'd probably say, who? <laughs> so uh, we will talk a little bit about it today because I think they had some really great things in common with you and in common um, with me, 
Even though we already pray, just pray with me quickly. I like to pray before I preach. Father, bless your word today, Father. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary, and Father, might you speak, Father, and anything that's not from you, might it be pushed aside, Father. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So far in the Gospel of Luke, um, if you haven't read the Gospel of Luke recently, maybe you watched the Charlie Brown special and you listened to Linus and uh, listened to his words as he told the Christmas story. So far in the Gospel of Luke, we see Gabriel's announcement of the birth of the Messiah in Luke chapter 1, Mary's response her humble adoration when she said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to your will, the promise and the birth of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the greatest man to be born of a woman. John the Baptist was described as a voice. Can you imagine just being described as a voice? a voice crying out in the wilderness, echoing what went on in the book of Isaiah, simply saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, and really was the introducer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he was not that light, but he bore witness of that light, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can read about that in John, the first chapter. He was the one who said, I must decrease, but he must increase. Truly a great man of God, and yet it ought to make us feel good that even John the Baptist had his doubts and fluctuated a little bit and needed some reassurance from his Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God Christ was willing to give that to him and didn't rebuke him and understood that he was but flesh. In Luke, the second chapter, Caesar's decree, which was no uh, accident to the Lord that all the world should be taxed. In verse 7, the birth of Jesus Christ and no room in the inn. Can you imagine there being no room for the Son of God and then growing up and not having anywhere to lay his head? The angel's announcement to the shepherd, shepherds, that the Messiah had been born and then the light show in the skies of the heavenly host. Uh, must have been spectacular, greater than any 4th of July demonstration you've ever seen in your life, and uh, proclaiming that the Son of God had been born. The shepherds travel back to Bethlehem to see this sight. Jesus is then presented in the temple at Jerusalem as their customs went. And God is such a great God, he made provision for poorer people people who could not afford to sacrifice a lamb could sacrifice two turtle doves or two young pigeons, if that's all they could afford. So they went there and they sacrificed and they offered Jesus to the Lord, kind of ironic, uh, as the Messiah was being dedicated there. And then finally something, as I mentioned earlier, you don't find in any Christmas cards, a forgotten couple, a man, a woman named Simeon and Anna. They were seeking God's perfect gift, both with different desires upon their heart. And I wonder this year, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? What is in the depths of your heart this morning? What do you seek to ask God for during this Christmas season? What is the thing that comes to mind as soon as I said that? The biggest thing, the largest thing, the thing that grips a hold of your heart. Matthew 6.21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Colossians 3.1 says, If you are raised with Christ, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We have a connection with the Lord God through our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to find our all in all in Jesus Christ. Believe it or not, it's greater than our hobbies. It's greater than our retirement plan. 
It's greater than where we'll go on vacation this summer. It's greater than what you have in the bank or how big your house is. To have a connection with God. To know the God of the universe. To be able to climb up on his lap and say affectionately, Abba, Father. And realize that we're saying, Daddy. And because of the blood of Christ, we have been redeemed. We have been purchased back from the slave market of sin. And when people run around saying, my salvation was free, it cost nothing, you know they're wrong. It was of great price. It was the blood, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important for us to know that. Hebrews 7.25 says we're saved to the uttermost. Meaning our past, our present, our future, our hurts, our anxieties, our insecurities. Uh, I have a lot of those things and I happen to believe that I have been saved from those things. And I actually believe that many times God will bring those things to my mind, even though I don't like them, to help some of you, to help somebody else to talk about the things that have gone on in my life and hurt me and maybe discouraged me because maybe you're going through the same thing yourself and to let you know that whatever you're going through, God is able. Hurts, hang-ups, habits, to be able to let you know, you knew I'd get that in there, to be able to let you know that God is able to meet your deepest need. Now Luke we find who also wrote the book of Acts. Luke uses a Greek word that highlights the anticipation of Simeon and Anna, showing their excitement as they awaited the coming Messiah. And my message isn't long today. It's really just two points and a couple of sub-points. You know, and it's on Simeon is point number one, and Anna... Point number two, and then just some things to think about in closing. But Simeon waited for comfort. Look with me at your Bible if you have it open still. Luke, the second chapter, verse 25. If my faithful friend Scott has given you a bulletin, make sure that you do take notes and write these things down because we are also seeking after the Lord who can meet the desires of our heart. Start taking notes if you don't. Start writing things down. Start pondering them when you go home and meditating upon them. And uh, God will bless you for that. Luke 2 and verse 25 says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation or comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, the consolation, the comfort of Israel. We've all sang that hymn, No One Cares for Me Like Jesus. Amen. Just a great song. Nobody cares for you like the Son of God. People will let you down. Family members will let you down. The people that you trust in the most will let you down, but Christ will never let you down. The Bible says that Simeon was righteous and devout. And this is how my mind works. It's like, Lord, why did you choose to put that in the story? Because 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all Good work, so God wanted it there. And 2 Peter 1.21 says, The word of God is of no private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God wanted us to know that Simeon, who waited for the consolation of the Lord, who waited and hung out in the temple and looked for godly things to happen, he was just. He was devout. He was somebody who loved God with all his heart, and I like that he was righteous. Amen? We don't come up with righteousness on our own, do we? It's the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Simeon looked forward to the Savior coming, just like we look back 
It's always by faith. Now in verse 26, Simeon had good reason to hope because the Messiah's coming had been revealed to him. He would not see death until his eyes fell upon the Lord's Christ. God had revealed that to him. So he looked for comfort. Do we need comfort? If you've never needed comfort, stick around. You will need comfort. You will need consolation. You will go through some difficult times where only the Lord will care for you and your need and meet all of your need in the deepest, deepest way. Christ is spoken about in the Old Testament. I mean, the whole Bible is about Jesus. Starting way back in Genesis 3.15, and if you jump up to, to places like Psalm 22, it speaks about his, re, his crucifixion there. If you go to Isaiah 53, it talks about him laying down his life and being a sacrifice and being led as a lamb to slaughter for you and me. It talks about the Father seeing that sacrifice, seeing that death, and being satisfied. And then it talks about you and I being the seed that would come through that death, through that crucifixion, and through that resurrection. Zechariah is filled with prophetic verses about the Savior. Micah 5, 2 talks about Bethlehem and talks about the one who is of old, from everlasting, being born in a little place called Bethlehem. The Bible is filled with wonderful scriptures speaking about the Savior. One of my favorites is Isaiah 9-6. It contains all the ingredients for comfort. It's very, very precious, and it meets a universal human need. It says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The only one who can bring peace into your life is Jesus Christ. We all struggle with loneliness. Insecurities, desperation, emptiness, but God is the God of all comfort. Aren't you glad? That's why we witness. That's why we say be salt and light. Why tell anybody about Jesus if he hasn't turned your world right side up? and made things special, and given you purpose. Do you remember before Christ when you said, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Remember those days? It's got to be more than this. Haven't you ever said that? Because of the disappointments, and the heartaches, and the tragedies, and the world we live in, it's got to be more than this. It's got to be. There's got to be a plan. There's got to be a God. There's got to be something that's intricate and infinite in nature that will go on after us. And that's what we're living for. What will go on after us and the generations that will come after us. Important. 2 Corinthians 1.3, if you're taking notes. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, God is the God of all comfort. God is the Father of comfort mercies. And I want you to do me a favor. Turn to Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10 is one of my favorite verses in the Word of God. I get kind of excited when I know that God feels this way about me. You know? We meet family sometimes. Well, you know, we never use the love word. We don't say it too often, but you know I love you. You know, I've always met your need. I've always worked a job. I've always done this. I've always done that. I'm sorry. I'm an emotional guy. I need to hear it sometimes. And I need to say it to others. And I need to tell them why I love them. I need to tell you why I love you at times. Because it's important for us to know that we're loved and we're comforted. Verse 10 of Isaiah 41, it says, Fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right 
hand. And let me read another verse to you, mark it down. Job, the fifth chapter, verse 11. The Old Testament is filled with verses about God's comfort. Job 5 and verse 11 says, He sets on high those that are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. That's comfort, folks. That's the comfort of Almighty God. And if you're like, I'm not feeling it, Pastor Gary, ask God to help you to realize it, to acknowledge it, to know it in your heart of hearts. It's got to be more than the intellect. It's got to be more than just knowing of God. It's got to be knowing God. The Bible says in the book of James, the demons also believe and tremble. Our faith has to be vibrant, and we have to love the Lord and realize how much he loves us. What a great God. In verse 28, Simeon lifts the child out of Mary's arms in the temple. A little shocking. Can you imagine if that happened in 2015? You know, in the world we live in, a volatile society, a dangerous place. You'd be quite upset if an old man grabbed your child, your baby, out of your arms. But here, what great confirmation. Everybody knew Simeon's story. Everybody knew how long he had been there. Everybody knew Anna's story and how she had fasted and prayed for years and years and years as a widow, which brings me to Anna. Let's just talk a little bit about her. She waited for forgiveness. Remember when you were forgiven? Remember when you understood it for the first time? My sins have been forgiven. The burden has been taken from my back. Have you ever read that Pilgrim's Progress and read about Pilgrim, you know, as he walked along with the heavy weight on his back and finally, at the end of his journey, it was lifted off of him. And it's so symbolic of being a Christian and God taking the burden off our back. You might have a bad job. You might have challenges in relationships. You might have financial adversity, but your great burden of sin and guilt and pain has been lifted. God will remember your sin no more. As far as the east is from the west, he is willing to forgive you. I know you're still going to seek to, to work for what's right and justify yourself, not the way it works. God, who is perfect, wants to forgive. Anna was waiting for forgiveness, which also means redemption. She was looking for her country, Israel, to be purchased back by God from the slave market of sin. And the price would be a perfect sacrifice, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Thank God Jesus came to die. I talk to people in witnessing sometimes where they say, well, he was a good man, but, you know, he messed up. They nailed him to a cross. He fell short of his goal. No, the Greek word on the cross when he said it is finished is to telestai, meaning it is finished. He came to die. He came to be a perfect sacrifice. After Anna's husband died, she dedicated herself to fasting and prayer in the temple for all of these years. Have you fasted recently? Is it any fun not to eat? Whether it's food, whether it's drink, whatever it is, to deprive yourself of something that your flesh desires. I know of a young man who lives in Massachusetts, he has deprived himself of television. You say, big deal. What's that? Listen, if you're addicted to television, it's a big thing. If you, I mean, uh, when I get out of here today, some of you know where I'm going. You know, one o'clock. You know, I'm going to be waiting for kickoff. And I'm going to be watching the Patriots. And I'm going to get my snacks together. And it really would be a big price to pay if I said, nah, no TV today. I'm just going to read, and I'm just going to pray, and I'm hoping to God I don't fall under conviction with saying it at this point. 
because that would be really hard, very hard. But have you ever done without with something you really love, you really enjoy? Whatever it would be, you say, I'm going to hold back my desires, my flesh, that I can get closer to God, that I can meditate, that I can pray, that I can lift up spiritual things that I'd like to see happen. And God says when we put those things aside, His power is on us and He blesses us in a powerful, powerful way. What a great woman Anna was. Oh, it's going to be the TV evangelists that are going to be first in line up in heaven for rewards. I don't think so. I think the Annas and the Simeons, and I would name some of your names, but you would get mad at me, will be in line because you've served God sometimes in secret. You've put them first and you've prayed for others and you've been supportive and you've been a blessing. When I look at Anna, it causes me to think about my activities. And my attitudes. Hanging out in the temple for all those years, fasting and praying, looking for the forgiveness and the redemption of God. All I can say is I'm ashamed. That's all I can say. I'm ashamed when I think of the things I have to have. The things I need, but really they're just wants. And I think of somebody who They'd wake up in the morning and it was time to fast and pray all day long. Waiting for the forgiveness of God, the redemption, being purchased back by God through a sacrifice looking for the Messiah. I I am ashamed, and I'm not saying that as false humility or anything. I mean it. I mean it. I'm ashamed when I think of it. And it causes you to want to redirect your thoughts, your actions, your priorities, and do some things differently. She also looked forward to Jesus coming, but with a different perspective. She longed for forgiveness. Here was the one coming who would forgive and save people from their sin. We talked about John the Baptist earlier. We know what he said in John 1.29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's pretty cool. Only Jesus can take away your sin. Only Jesus can forgive you. Our part, cry out for mercy. Reach out by faith, and even the faith, he instills it in you. Well, I sought after God. No, you didn't. God put that in your heart. He gave you a hunger to seek after him and thank God for it. She longed for forgiveness, and she saw the fruition of that in the Savior. Now my question for you, as I really come to the end of things, who do you relate to more this morning? Do you relate to Simeon? Simeon looked for comfort, consolation. Do you relate to Anna? She looked for forgiveness, she looked for redemption, she looked to be purchased back. Maybe you're in need of comfort today. Maybe you're in need of forgiveness and redemption and coming to the Lord. But in your own heart, think about who you relate to more. When you came to Christ, which thing was it that really drew you? I need comfort. I need forgiveness. I need redemption. And there could be other things. It could be purpose It could be validation, am I important? I've never been treated as important, and God loves me. There could be a lot of reasons why we came to Christ or why we need to come to Christ. I don't know everybody's heart here this morning, God does. But let's, with that in mind, in closing, take a couple of action steps. What should we do if we're looking for God just like Simeon did, just like Anna did? Place yourself back in the time of the birth of Christ and you're Simeon or you're Anna and you're hanging out in the temple waiting for the Messiah and people are looking at you and they're just shaking their heads. Yeah, she's been there all her life. Never got remarried. She just dedicated herself to God. And she just prays and fasts and there's Simeon just doing his thing telling us it's going to happen. He has a promise. He's going to see the Christ child before he dies. He believes it. He's embraced it. 
Well, they took some action, didn't they? When everybody probably shook their head and said, what a waste of a life. Well, they're in Scripture, aren't they? I guess it wasn't a waste of life. We're talking about them today. Will anybody talk about us 2,000 years later, after we die? Not that we'll all anyone will be here. But let's take some action steps. Number one, verse 33, begin to marvel. I used to look at comic books when I was a kid called Marvel. You know, all the superheroes. I used to love it. Thor, Iron Man. All those great ones, you know, I don't know what your favorite ones were, but I, I love all those. I love those movies when they come out. They're so cool, you know. They're really great. I always thought to myself, I could lift that hammer. You know, no, I couldn't. Nobody could. Thor would take that hammer and he'd lay it. Remember when he laid it on his brother's chest so he couldn't get up? You know, pretty cool. Begin to marvel. Verse 33. And Joseph... And his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So here's mom and dad bringing baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. And they've got stuff going on like Anna and Simeon. And Simeon saying, this is the one. I've received the promise of the Messiah. God is true. Can you imagine the looks on Joseph and Mary's face? The confirmation, the excitement as they're hearing all this stuff. We like when our kids are lifted up and praised. Here you got a prophet, and a prophet is saying, the Messiah has arrived. The promise of God has come to fulfillment and fruition, and they began to marvel. Marvel means to be filled with wonder and astonishment. Has Christmas become a little bit too familiar? Has it become a little bit too predictable? Do you still have the awe, the wonder, the astonishment? Do we still marvel? I think of Paul on the road to Damascus when he was knocked down by the Son of God. Acts 9, 6 says, And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Marvel, astonishment. Do you remember the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when the storm hit? We like that story. And Jesus was woken up by his disciples and he calmed the sea. Can you imagine the looks on the disciples' faces? And then they said, What manner of man is this that even nature obeys him? They marveled. Astonishment. Astounded that they were watching the hand of God. Secondly, become a mover. Every time somebody in the Word of God got close to God or received Christ, and they said, what do you want me to do? God never said, ah, just go kill some time. There's not really anything on my mind that you need to do. You know, just work your job, take care of your family. I know you have your hobbies. Just do what you do. It's cool. Did God ever say that? Charles Stanley, God doesn't engage in chit-chat. Right? Charles Stanley, I, when I say that, everybody looks up. You know? We respect Charles Stanley. You know? God does not engage in chit-chat. When he says something, it's extremely important. We need to move by the Spirit of God, verse 27. Verse 38 talks about coming in that instant, giving thanks to God. Read 38 with me again. It says, And coming in that instant, speaking of Anna, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Is it any accident she came in at that moment? Again, all Scripture, given by inspiration of God. Anna walks in, there he is. Simeon walks in, there they are. And he takes the babe out of Mary's arms and says, here it is. The promise has been fulfilled in the fullness of time. We need to be 
movers. Mary was a mover. Luke one thirty eight says, she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She was compelled to take action. I don't know if you know this, but even though in the year I've been here, I'm not into speeches. Preaching is not a speech. I'm trying by the Holy Spirit's power to get you to do something. Every time I speak, I'm trying to get you to do something. So when people just kind of leave and say, well, that was really cool. That was nice. Really good. It seems like you spent some time on that. I want to look at you and say, what are you going to do with it now? What are you going to do? What action are you going to take? Because God is looking for movers. When we've been touched by God, how are we going to move? The shepherds were movers. Luke 2.15. After they received the announcement, after they saw the light show, they said, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass that the Lord has shown us. Let's get busy. Let's move. Let's do something. The wise men were movers. They were sent from Herod. Herod was a liar. Herod said, oh, what are the prophecies saying? Well, he should be born in Bethlehem. Oh, go and find him. And when you find him, come back and get me. I want to come and worship too. No, Herod wanted to kill this baby with all the prophecy that fell upon him. But the wise men went gold and frankincense and myrrh, and it says they worshipped him. They worshipped him. Only God receives worship. They worshipped him because they acknowledged him as God. They were movers, and God warned them to go a different way, not to return to Herod. Matthew 2, verses 7 to 12. How does the Spirit of God want you to move this morning? What decisions does he want you to make? Well, I, you know, I, I did all that stuff years ago. You know, it's time for the younger people to step up to the plate. You know, time for them to do something. Anna? Simeon? Were these young people? No, they were going to keep moving and keep seeking and keep praying and keep fasting until things came to fruition. Until they received the promise. God has promises for you today. God wants to work miracles in our life today and we should serve him until we're in his presence. Some of the greatest work we'll do, we'll do in our latter years. Because maybe we're a little more humble. Maybe we have a little more wisdom. Maybe we've learned something. Maybe. And God can use us in a great way. Are you willing Are you broken? Are you available? Finally, the third thing, become a messenger. Salt, light. Verse 38, we've already read it. Anna thanked God and spoke about the child to all those who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. You ever have somebody talk to you and they're all excited and you don't want to hear them? You know, it's like, oh no, here here she comes. Here he comes. You ever go to Thanksgiving and the lost people are sad that you're there? (laughs) <laughs> yeah and they're, oh here comes Rudy <laughs> and they try to divert the conversation quite a turkey huh <laughs> how about those desserts you know did you see Bill's knot on his tie unbelievable right Bill and I were fighting over our knots on our ties today you know when somebody's excited about something, they're almost unstoppable. I wish he'd shut up. I wish she'd shut up. They're so into it. Shouldn't you be into God? We're into a lot of things, you know? Let me tell you about the golf lessons I took. You know? Let me tell you about the new uh, Star Wars that just came out. Let me tell you about, you know, the new, the new restaurant I went to. You know, not your average Joes, right? (laughs) I'm going to get you all today, right? 
you know, let me tell you about this. And we're just like, oh, you ever have somebody talk to you about something that's just stupidity and they're excited about it? And you say to yourself, and you say, how come I'm not excited about the Lord like that? You ever say that to yourself? You know, maybe they're doing the stamp program at Shaw's. Oh, did you get your stamps? You gotta get your stamps! Right? And we're like, how come I don't witness like that? You know? What'd you do on Sunday? We were in church. (laughs) Yeah? And they're over there. Did you get the stamps? Did you put them in your book? I go to Walgreens and they say, "Um, you want to use your points? I'm like, I got points? Oh, yeah. Really? How many? I get all excited. Well, your bill was $21, now it's 9 I'm about ready to do a cartwheel, and I can't do a cartwheel. You know, click my heels together. I mean, I get all excited. And I think, do I get this excited about Jesus? I'm serious. You know, let's be into God, excited about it. I'm not say be, you know be an idiot about it or, you know, some sort of a grinning idiot where you're being foolish. In love with him. Thrilled to share him. And when you get all done, you know, not, well, gee, what do they think? Who cares what they think? If we really love them and we want them to go to heaven and we want them to be close to God, who cares what they think? One day they're going to look at us and say, why didn't you tell me? Right? Right? They will. So become a messenger. Christmas is wonderful. Everyone can find answers to their deepest need. What are you looking for today? Maybe you're already saved, but God's knocking on your heart saying, I want more from you. I want you to be committed. I want you to be overwhelmed with my goodness and my grace and my redemption and my comfort. Won't you serve me? How much time do we have left, folks? I know the young, you know, young people, teenagers, they're invincible. You know, you don't talk to teenagers about dying, and yet I've done many teenage funerals. I've done funerals where the little, I'm not trying to, you know, be dramatic here, but I've done funerals where the, I'm standing here and the casket is this big. Because the child, the place is packed. You know what it means in a, in a community when a child dies. You never anticipate that stuff. You know? You've got to be 90 or 85 or 75 at least. You know, that's when you die. Tragedy hits everybody. And we need to look to God for comfort, for forgiveness, for redemption, for purpose. Find out what he wants from us and dedicate our lives here and now and for all eternity to his cause. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed, eyes closed, just for a moment, folks. Thank God for Simeon. Thank God for Anna. Even though they've passed on, they still speak. Their hearts are still in the right place. And we look back and we say, here are some people who sought after the Lord. There are some people who dedicated their life to the Lord. Thank God for that. Maybe you're here today and you're seeking some things in your life. Maybe like Anna, maybe like Simeon. And there's spiritual desires or things God is laying on your heart. And maybe by an uplifted hand you'd say, Pastor God's speaking to my heart. There are some things I seek after and I, I want to seek after them until I see them come to fruition. Pray for me. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, folks. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. Every age group represented hands going up and praise God for that. I've got some desires. I, I want to know God's plan and purpose for my life. We're not all going to be missionaries or Christian school teachers. But God wants to use you in your circle of influence in a powerful way. Maybe you're here today and you might say, Pastor, I'm not sure I know Christ as Savior. Maybe you need to right now in the quietness of your heart because I do not know your heart. 
I have had people that I thought knew Christ as Savior who received Christ and raised their hand. I've seen students at Bible college receive Christ as Savior. I saw a professor come to Christ years and years and years ago at Bible college. Maybe right now you need to say quietly in your heart, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I fall short of your glory. I know if I died right now, I'd be separated from you for all eternity because you're perfect. And I could not possibly inhabit heaven with you. I need salvation. I know that Jesus died for my sin. I know that Jesus is God and that he conquered the grave and that he loves me and he died for me. And right now I'm asking forgiveness, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart and be my Savior. And the best I know how, I'll live my life for you. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I can't take it away, but God can. Lord Jesus, save me. Now maybe with your head bowed and your eyes closed, nobody looking around, you might by an uplifted hand say, Pastor Garrett, I just want you to know I prayed that. And I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you prayed it sincerely, God heard your prayer. And in a moment, in an instant, you moved from darkness to light. And your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Have you done that? Pastor Gare, I did it just now. Keep me in prayer, please. Anyone like that? As I wait just a minute, no one's looking around, and I won't call out your name. Anybody? Father, thank you that we can be in your house today. Lord, we talk about all kinds of things that are meaningless. They don't really mount up to anything. And right now we're talking about the souls of men and women. We're talking about the consolation, the comfort, the forgiveness, the redemption of every human being who comes to Christ. Thank you for what you did on our behalf because of your great love for us. Thank you for the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. Thank you that you know our name and you have a purpose for us. Thank you for each hand that went up, Father, as you touched hearts this morning. Help us to think very seriously about Simeon and Anna and their dedication and their love for you and their belief in your promises. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let me just give you a couple of quick announcements. We'll take an offering and then Michael's going to